Welcome to another episode of Untold Legends, where we explore the stories found within the world of video games, movies, comic books, and anything in between. In part one of the perfect Castlevania timeline, we saw the man once known as Matthias Kronquist betray his close friend Leon Belmont in order to inherit the powers of darkness and leave his humanity behind. After Leon swore to hunt down Matthias and all like him, his bloodline continued hunting the knight for generations, and Matthias was reborn as Vlad Tepes Dracula, Lord of Darkness and King of the Vampires. But after the Belmont clan finally confronted Dracula through the efforts of Sonia Belmont in the mid-1400s, she spared his life and he agreed to leave the humans alone. With the battle over, Dracula moved his castle to another location away from her village, and Sonia gave birth to her son Trevor Belmont. Trevor's father died while he was still young, and he was raised by his mother throughout his adolescence in the Belmont estate. She followed the Belmont traditions of her ancestors and taught Trevor the same monster hunting techniques that she had learned growing up. But Trevor was too young to master the vampire killer whip. The true story and technique behind the whip's creation was mostly lost to time, mysterious even to the Belmonts, and multiple attempts were made to replicate it. One attempt came close and resulted in a whip consecrated to kill demons. While nowhere near as powerful as the vampire killer, this whip could still harm the creatures of the night and seal away powerful vampires. They called this whip the Hunter Whip, and the Belmonts usually used it as a training whip until they were experienced enough to wield the vampire killer. While Trevor spent his days training with the Hunter Whip, Dracula spent most of his time peacefully traveling the world and inviting like-minded individuals shunned from human society to his castle. Castlevania attracted the darkest souls, searching for knowledge on the dark arts practiced inside. During this time, the church in Eastern Europe had been infiltrated by corrupt individuals seeking power for themselves. One such individual was the bishop. He dreamed of becoming the head of the church and imposed his will across those he deemed unworthy. He influenced multiple witch trials and many innocent people fell victim. A young man named Isaac fled from his town with his younger sister Julia. She was falsely accused of being a witch and together they sought out Dracula's castle. The sanctuary rumored to welcome those with dark hearts. They stood before the gates of the castle and prepared to enter. In another town, a young boy named Hector fell victim to similar circumstances. He was born with white hair, unusual for a child his age and none of the other kids would play with him, often hitting him with rocks and bullying him. His mother never wanted him and showed him no love, and his father was an alchemist that only cared about his work. Hector's only solace was with animals. He connected with them in ways that nobody else could and felt no love towards other humans. As he grew older, he watched his father work and developed his own form of alchemy that could create life from death. Hector's mother was horrified at the magic he'd learned, and that same magic attracted demons that posed as the animals that he loved so much. They wanted to take advantage of the darkness growing inside Hector, and they set a fire to the village. As it burned, the villagers instantly blamed Hector and chased him away. I never wanted you, Hector. You sickened me. Do you understand? The moment you came out of me, I knew you were wrong. Alchemy is for money and power, boy. Money and power and buying our safety are all that matters. Stop whining about cruelty. This is the world. This is the way things are. Now get away from me. Hector? Hector, unlock this door at once! Are you burning something out there? Ah! 
demons followed Hector and encouraged him to seek out Dracula's castle. Inside the castle, Isaac had spent much time learning dark magic, and Julia had actually learned enough to become a witch. She didn't harbor the same hatred for humanity that her brother did, and eventually left the castle to live among humans, and kept her power secret. Isaac gave fully into his own darkness and wanted to learn as much as possible. He worshipped Dracula, almost obsessively, and even though he was human, Isaac's loyalty to Dracula was only rivaled by death. One day, a new human appeared at the castle gates looking for sanctuary. It was Hector, having finally found his new home. The two boys grew into young men, incredibly skilled in the magic of devil forging. They were capable of reviving the dead and transforming them into creatures loyal to them. They could create beings called innocent devils gifted with multiple abilities and forms. They could merge objects together to craft new ones and practiced against each other in combat. Isaac and Hector were the only two humans to master these arts and were the only two humans Dracula actually considered friends. Although they made their home inside Castlevania for years, they weren't prisoners and were free to leave any time. Hector felt that he learned as much as he could and left to create a life of his own, where he could practice his magic in isolation, alongside the dead animals he revived to keep him company. Isaac chose to stay in the castle and refused to leave Dracula's side. The second half of the 1400s would bring about dark times for humanity. In a world where vampires and creatures of the night lived, the evil found within humans would be the catalyst of their own destruction. The bishop had gained a massive amount of influence and the populace was terrified of imaginary threats more than ever. The Belmont clan was feared by the local and were widely misunderstood. They were seen as practitioners of black magic that attracted evil. A scared mob organized and were determined to drive the Belmonts out of their land. The Belmont estate was attacked and set on fire, while Trevor was held down by the villagers outside and forced to watch his home burn. Sonia was caught inside and hid the vampire killer inside a chest, deep under the structure before attempting to escape. By the time the fire engulfed everything, the villagers had already left. Trevor suffered an injury over his left eye, leaving a deep scar, and he rushed in to find his mother, but he found her lifeless body. She had sacrificed her life to hide the vampire killer. From that day forward, he held a deep resentment towards the rest of the world, and he left his home, traveling alone. All he had left from his previous life was the hunter whip he had trained with and the clothing on his back. As the year 1475 approached, word of Lisa's practices in medicine began reaching the bishop, and he decided to pay her a visit. Many villagers had seen Dracula visiting her and spoke of a husband that was never home. Rumors were spreading that she had married the devil and used witchcraft to heal sickness. Practices that enraged the bishop. What do you need? Tell me. I'll gladly give it to you. Silence. I will not be silent. Just let me help. With Satan's tools? <laughs> I don't think so. Excuse me? What are you doing here that you need to subject the good people of this land to such fearsome engines? I don't understand. Look around you. Do you pretend that these things are not witchcraft? <laughs> it moves on its own. What is this? It's medicine. How can engines of the devil be physic, woman? Take her to the cathedral at Targo Vista. There shall be an inquisition. Destroy everything in this room. Let no trace of her magic remain. Lisa knew what atrocities Dracula was capable of. She begged the bishop not to bring down her husband's wrath. Dracula had no idea his wife was taken away since he was traveling at the time, and Lisa was taken by the bishop's men to the town square to be burned alive as a witch. Please, you don't know what you're going to bring upon yourself if you harm me. You threaten me. Get her out of here before I strike her dead. Please! He's come so far! Don't make him do it! No, don't make him kill you all! Please! Alucard rushed from the castle to rescue his mother. When he arrived, he saw his mother being prepared for execution and tied up. She urged him not to act. Saving her would almost certainly require Alucard to cause a great deal of harm. In her final words to her son, Lisa stated, Do not hate humans. If you cannot live with them, then at least do them no harm, for theirs is already a hard lot. It took everything within him to hold back his desire to rescue his mother, but he respected her wishes and returned to the castle distraught.
So there were devil engines in her house, Bishop. I saw them with my own eyes. And glass in shapes you've never seen. Thin as paper. Lightning. Strange weeds and tools. Witches things. Don't hurt them! They don't understand! Who's she talking to? I believe she's exhorting Satan not to take revenge on us. They don't know what they're doing! Be better than them! Please! When Dracula returned from his travels, he visited Lupu Village, where Lisa lived, as he had done every time he returned home, and discovered the charred remains of her house. He recognized the old lady that Lisa treated multiple times, one of the villagers that loved her dearly, and asked her what happened, and he learned the truth. The second time he would experience the tragedy of losing a loved one, but this time she was taken from him by humans, the same species he had shown mercy to. I couldn't be there. I don't care what they say, I won't take joy in that woman being killed by the church. I'm here remembering her instead. I do this last kindness in her name. She, who loved you humans and cared for your ills. Take your family and leave Wallachia tonight. Pack and go and do not look back. For no more do I travel as a man. What have you done? What have you done to my wife? Oh no. Oh God! Dracula! He was supposed to be missed. A story made up by heretics. She... She's a witch. I, I give you one year, Wallachians. You have one year to make your peace and remove any marks you've made upon the land. One year, and then I'll wipe all human life from the land of Wallachia. You took that which I love. So I will take from you everything you have, and everything you have ever been. One year. All the work Lisa had done to bring back the man inside Dracula had been undone by the actions of the bishop. Dracula was beyond being consoled for the murder of his wife. He had loved her fiercely and the human race would pay for their crimes. Dracula demanded the complete and utter extinction of mankind and calculated it would take him one year to form an army big enough to wipe out all life. He began summoning creatures from hell and forming plans to destroy the entire world. First he would start in Europe, then the rest of the world. His loyal devil forger Isaac was equally enraged about the death of Lisa and promised to help Dracula destroy humanity. He also reached out to Hector to help him complete his armies, but he knew Hector didn't harbor the same hatred that Isaac did. Instead of revealing his true plan, Hector had to believe that humanity would would simply be maintained and controlled. Hector, I have need of your skill. Tell me what you need. I need an army. What's happened? Why do you need an army? They killed my wife. They? The human. The stupid, vicious, spiteful, evil humans. The humans you renounced. The humans you live apart from. They killed my wife. I am so sorry. No more, Hector. They must be stopped. 
Hector barely recognized Dracula. He hadn't seen him in some time, and he was far from the strong, educated man he once knew. Dracula seemed so broken and seething with a deep rage. It was painful to see him in that condition, and Hector agreed to help him build his army, as long as it was used to scale back the human race and keep them from causing any more harm. Hector moved back into the castle and began his work. If humans became livestock, I would have no concern over that. If conditions were humane, I was going to say merciful. Oh, yes. I can promise a merciful end to the human plague, Hector. A cull. Controlled population. Making sure they cannot harm anyone else. Yes. Dracula summoned vampire lords from all over the world and placed them in charge of his armies, while Isaac and Hector continuously forged new monsters. Alucard attempted to quell his father's anger, but the man he knew as his father was completely gone, replaced by murderous rage. With a heavy heart, Alucard left the castle and truly understood that he had no choice but to confront his father. His father had to die. Alucard, they called me. The opposite of you. Mother never liked that. Did you know that? She hated the idea that I might define myself by you, even in opposition to you. She loved us both, enough that she wanted us to be our own people, living our own lives, making our own choices. And so here I am, choosing to honor my mother by killing my father. No longer Adrian Tepesh. Choosing to be Alucard of Wallachia. The name of my mother's people. I'm sorry, mother. I grieve with you. But I won't let you commit genocide. That woman was the only reason on Earth for me to tolerate human life! Then find the one who did the deed. If you loose an army of the night on Wallachia, you cannot undo it. And many thousands of people just as innocent as her will suffer and die. There are no innocents! Not anymore! Any one of them could have stood up and said, No, we won't behave like animals anymore. I won't let you do it. <laughs> Alucard wasn't strong enough to face Dracula alone, and his father's attack injured him severely. He fled the castle and hid himself underneath the town of Greshet, while he recovered from his wounds. Using the knowledge he learned from his father, he built mechanical defenses to protect himself while he was recovering and went into hibernation. Some of the people in Greshet occasionally heard rumors about Alucard's tomb, and legends formed of a sleeping soldier that would one day awaken to rescue them from an enormous threat. Dracula was alone, his wife was dead, and his son had turned against him. The following year, in 1476, he unleashed his wrath and the war on humanity had started, beginning with the same location where his wife had been killed.
Eastern Europe was thrust into a state of chaos. The monstrous hordes would come at night and decimate villages whole, leaving few alive. And the church sent a massive army of their own to fight back. The army was annihilated with little effort, and they desperately reached out for help. For some time, the church had secretly used people talented in magical arts to fight for humanity against dark forces. And the speakers answered the call. Speakers were a group of nomadic scholars that passed on their history orally and sought to help the people of Valachia. They were talented in powerful magic and agreed to help the church destroy Dracula. But the bishop had plans of his own. When they arrived in Valachia, he demonized them and convinced the population that they were the ones responsible for the hordes of monsters attacking. The speakers went into hiding and helped the people from the shadows. In the town of Greshit, the speakers heard rumors of the sleeping soldier underground that would save the world. And the elder speaker's granddaughter, Saifa Belnades, went off by herself to find him. But her mission was a failure. On the way, she encountered one of Dracula's Cyclops and was turned into stone, condemned to a living death and unable to move. Rebel groups were forming in multiple locations, planning to storm Dracula's castle directly. One of those groups was led by a man named Grant Dynasty, a noble pirate in his younger years that had amassed an enormous fortune and retired to the countryside. But Dracula's monsters had destroyed his home and taken the life of many people he cared for. His group made it to the castle but were decimated by the creatures inside. Grant was the only survivor. As punishment for leading the group, Dracula turned Grant into a mindless creature, a transformation that could be seen happening from a distance. Grant was thrown into the clock tower and forgotten. All hope seemed to be lost for humanity. A Belmont still lived, but Trevor was a broken man. From his teenage years into adulthood, he traveled alone, drinking away his sorrows, aimless and with no aspirations. News of Dracula's war on humanity spread from town to town, and Trevor was well aware that Dracula had marked the human race for extinction, but he had no interest in getting involved. The people of Europe demonized his family after they had spent hundreds of years fighting the supernatural to protect them. Just one more drink and then I'll leave, all right? That's a Belmont crest. Never met them. Listen, just forget it. I'll just go. Now, you're a Belmont. Everyone knows. The Belmonts dealt in black magic. The Belmonts dealt with monsters. The Belmonts fought monsters, son. Whoa! I used to fight fucking vampires. I'm Trevor fucking Belmont. And I've never lost a fight to man, nor fucking beast. Oh, Christ. I hope you all bleed out. Mm. Through your asses! Mm. Every last rat busted one of you. After a night of drinking, Trevor, armed with the hunter whip as protection, began wandering to the next town, leading us to the events of Castlevania III, Dracula's Curse, in the year 1476. The hordes had spread so deep into Eastern Europe that Trevor was forced to fight back against them to save his own life. He was deep in a nearby swamp fighting creatures that didn't belong in the human world. Mud men, animals possessed with violent urges, and even bats that could multiply themselves. <laughs> Trevor continued through the forest overnight and arrived in the town of Greshit. He saw firsthand the senseless slaughter of innocents that Dracula's hordes were causing. Men, women, children, it didn't matter. After speaking with the people in town, he learned that a group of speakers were there. Belmonts knew the speakers were a nomadic tribe and magically gifted, but the townspeople were convinced that the speakers caused the monsters to come due to the bishop's teachings. Once the bishop learned that a Belmont was in town, he summoned him. And Trevor questioned the false accusations he was making against them, the same crimes that were committed against his own family. I'm here to save Grishit. And how do you intend to do that? I brought you here to answer some questions, not ask them. Well, tough shit. How exactly 
Do you intend to help these people by killing speakers? The speakers brought these troubles upon themselves. One cannot live without God. Quite literally, in these days. You think the Night Hawks came because people weren't religious enough? Your life, Melmont. Take it and go. Tonight, the speakers will be dealt with, and then Greshit will be secure. My God. You really believe it, don't you? You could undo everything by your very presence. You will leave Greshit by sundown, or you will not see the morning. Do I make myself clear? My family committed no crime. You people simply decided we were wrong to defend this land against the supernatural, and now... You Belmonts have never understood the power of the word of God! The people of this city are mine! The other great cities are lost or losing. Greshit will be the last major city in Wallachia. To all intents and purposes, I will be the child. Trevor left with the impression that the bishop was completely out of his mind and decided to leave the city immediately. On the way out, he happened to encounter an old man being harassed by the bishop's men. It was the elder of the speakers. Trevor attempted to convince himself to ignore the situation, but his mother's love was a part of him, and deep inside he cared about helping innocent people. He couldn't stand by and let them hurt a defenseless old man. I'm sorry. I was trying to snatch the stave out of your hand. How's your finger? What fucking finger? Kill him now! Last warning, this will get nasty. Pick him up. Take him back to your church. Don't bother this man or his people again. I am the elder of the Calderia speakers. Thank you for your kindness, and I think you're restrained. You're welcome, Elder. The speakers were risking their lives hiding within the city. If they showed their face publicly, a violent mob would surely form. Even though the church had sent them to help, the bishop had twisted the minds of the people so much that they hated them. The elder speaker begged Trevor to stay and help his granddaughter Sypha. The last he heard from her was when she decided to search for the fabled sleeping soldier alone, and Trevor agreed to follow her trail. He tracked her to a mysterious chamber filled with technology he had never seen before. Lights that required no fire, he instantly knew this was the inside of Dracula's castle based on his family's attempted mappings of the castle. Unknown to most people, Dracula's castle reached deep underground wherever it landed and stretched for miles in all directions. It housed chambers that held many secrets and creatures from times past. One of them was the Cyclops from ancient Greek lands that turned Sypha into stone. Either someone left a statue of a speaker down here or... Family bestiary. into a cyclops. 
Turns you to stone with his eyeball and feeds on your terror while you're trapped in your own body. I met your grandfather. Time to go home. Your people think you're dead. The least you can do is set that old man's mind to rest. But this sleeping warrior is still down here. There is no sleeping warrior. Just a cyclops waiting for people stupid enough to go looking. The old wisdom says the tomb is guarded. Yeah, yeah. Come on. Sypha reunited with her grandfather, and he thanked Trevor for rescuing her. Trevor urged the speakers to leave the city before nightfall, but they refused. The speakers were determined to stay and help the people of Greshet, and the elder knew Trevor had it within him to reclaim his family's honor and fight for the human race. I don't think we can leave these people. Not in their time of need. These people believe you're causing their time of need. Does one run away when someone tells lies about them? What have the church said about the Belmonts? That you have been corrupted by dealings with the supernatural? And what did you do in the face of that? I didn't run away. Really? So what are you running to? You're calling me a coward. No. I am calling you defeated, Trevor Belmont. You fought your battle, and you decided you lost. We didn't have a choice. Perhaps. But we do. You'll lose. We might well lose. But if nothing else, we might show someone that although battles are won and lost, there is a larger war at stake. A war for the soul of our people. Because if we truly are the sort of people who will kill one another at the behest of a madman's fantasies, then perhaps it is right and proper that things from hell should rise up to wipe us out. It's time for those of us who fight that war to stand up and be responsible, Trevor Belmont. <sighs> the Elder's words inspired Trevor to defend the city as night fell, and Dracula's armies returned to destroy what had survived from their last raid. The undead were returning to life outside the city, and skeleton knights were appearing from the underworld. Trevor unleashed the might of the Belmont clan on the monsters, but many demons had already made it within the city. The bishop hid away inside his church, waiting for the speakers to be killed. People he saw as pagans that threatened his rule. But his false sense of security was about to be shattered, and the sins of the false holy man would be repaid. Speaker's dead. No. Well, get back out there. The speakers have to die before the sun goes down. The sun is already down. Enter the house of God. God is not here. This is an empty box. Your God knows that we wouldn't be here without you. This is all your fault, isn't it? She was a witch. Lies in your house of God? No wonder he has abandoned you. We couldn't be here without you. responsible for causing the genocide of the human race was dead, and Sypha fought alongside Trevor to defend the people of Greshit, and for the first time Trevor witnessed thankful villagers looking up to a Belmont for protection instead of fearing them. My family, the family you demonized and excommunicated, has fought and died through generations for this country. We do this thing for Wallachia and her people. We don't have to know you all. We do it anyway, and it's not the dying that frightens us. It's never having stood up and fought for you. I am Trevor Belmont, 
of the House of Belmont. And dying has never frightened me. He took charge and gathered them to fight back. Even if he challenged Dracula, he couldn't be everywhere at once and taught them how to defend themselves using techniques he had learned from Sonia. Fight! Up front now! What? Why? Because I'm the only man here who knows how to fight these things. Everyone with a pike or long weapon, get out in front with me. Six in front, six behind, and in between. Pikes forward, hold steady. I need a priest, one who was properly ordained in a church. Grab some people, go to the nearest well, start drawing water. You know what to do with water, yes? For the aspersion, go. Cypher? Yes. I want them walled in when they hit the square. I want it so they can only come towards us. I want salt over here, as much as you can find! Everyone with a sword wipes their blades in the salt. Cypher, walls. Demon's explosion caused the ground to shatter underneath Sypha and Trevor, and they found themselves deeper into the catacombs than where she was originally found. Sypha had barely scraped the surface of the hidden chambers inside. They traveled through avoiding many death traps. Alucard was recovering deep inside, and the traps he had placed were necessary to protect him while he was hibernating. Trevor and Sypha eventually found his chamber, and she excitedly believed that she had discovered the sleeping soldier. But Trevor knew better than to believe such myths. He knew exactly what Alucard was. Why are you here? The story. The Messiah sleeps under Greshit, the man who will save us from Dracula. And you? Are you in search of a mythical savior? You're asking if I believe you're some sleeping messiah who'll save us, and no, I don't. Belmont! I know what you are. And what am I? You're a vampire. Alucard learned as much as he could about the Belmonts after he found out that Sonia was one of them and knew Trevor must have been his old friend's son. He was also aware of the legend of the Sleeping Soldier. The speakers believed the legend was a message from the future. It told of a hunter and a scholar that would meet the Sleeping Soldier. Everything was happening exactly as the legend foretold. But Trevor was much different than Sonia. He seemed reckless and unreasonable, and Alucard had to test him before he could decide to recruit his help. The Belmonts killed vampires. And now Dracula is carrying out an execution order on the human race. Do you care, Belmont? Honestly, I didn't. No. But now, it's time to stop it. Do you think you can? What I think is I'm going to have to kill you. Belmont, no! You think you can? If you're really a Belmont and not some runt running around with a family crest, you might be able to. Mm. 
Adrian Tepesh, known to the Wallachians as Alucard, son of Vlad, Dracula Tepesh. I've been asleep here in my private keep under Greshit for a year to heal the wounds dealt by my father when I attempted to stop him unleashing his demon armies. You are the sleeping soldier. I'm aware of the stories. So what happens now? I need a hunter and a scholar. I need help to save Wallachia. Perhaps the world. And defeat my father. Why? Because it is what my mother would have wanted. And we are all, in the end, slaves to our family's wishes. You'll help us kill Dracula and save Wallachia. My father has to die. We three. We can destroy him. Alucard decided to join forces with Sypha and Trevor to destroy his father. Word quickly spread of Dracula's forces being pushed out of Greshit by Belmont. Humanity was beginning to regain hope that a savior was fighting for them, and the news of a Belmont still existing reached Dracula. He remembered the threat that Sonya posed, and her child could be an even bigger problem for him. When Dracula's vampire generals discovered that a Belmont was on his way, his court fell into a full-blown panic, and chaos ensued. A Belmont? If there is a Belmont left alive, then should we not observe the ancestral Belmont home? Why? Perhaps on the general notion that the Belmonts hunted the likes of us for fucking centuries. And if there's one left alive, then it may have access to the trove of weapons and magical materials talked of across generations but never found, which they used to hunt us through fucking centuries. This is your war council, my lord. While they argued what to do next, Trevor and his allies decided to travel back to the old Belmont estate, where he grew up. His training as a full-blown vampire hunter wasn't complete before his mother died, so his knowledge on Dracula and the castle was very limited. He knew his ancestors before him had a problem locating it, with the castle constantly moving from location to location. If the estate held any secrets that could help them, it would be hidden underneath its ruins. And after traveling for miles in the forest, Alucard detailed his father's plans to destroy the human race. He had read his books filled with potential horrific ideas to exact his revenge against those that wronged him. He's gone mad. And from that, there is no recovering him. Shame. It's a tragedy. He's a repository of centuries of learning. He could have changed the world. I think he might have, if Mother hadn't died. If the religious inquisition hadn't proved true all of his worst instincts about humans. And now he's going to use her death as an excuse to destroy the world. All the world will still be here, Belmont. But you won't be here. And you won't be here. None of you. He writes in great books, you know. He used the covers himself from oak and wraps them in the preserved skin of the people who he hated most. And he writes plans, I've seen them. Ideas for darkening clouds and making them as permanent in the air as the frost of the north. Great strange flying machines that pull shrouds across the sky to block out the sun. A world without humans, under endless invented night. 
and Dracula and his castle. His revenge so horribly complete that there is nothing left to do but look out over a world without art or memory or laughter and know that he did his work well. That he did it all for love. It was time to continue moving towards the Belmont estate. The forest was still filled with monsters traveling the roads from city to city, and the trio of Trevor, Sypha, and Alucard combined their powers, working together to destroy a small group led by some of Death's direct subordinates, Slagra and Gaibon. The demon knight Slagra wielded a powerful spear, and his companion Gaibon transported him in the air and generated fireballs. <laughs> For now, the local towns were safe. Back in Dracula's castle, one of Dracula's loyal servants began doubting his rule, Carmilla, a vampire that was turned years ago by her own master. She murdered him, took over his castle, and ruled over her own faction of vampires. She believed that Dracula's rage was blinding him, putting all vampire kind in danger. Carmilla saw how uncomfortable Hector had become with the senseless slaughter and tried to convince him to betray Dracula. His original belief was that the human race would be managed, controlled by the vampires, but the reality was total and complete genocide. He had been lied to, and Carmilla's attempt at betrayal would be punished. Dracula's castle had eyes and ears everywhere, and he would not tolerate traitors within his ranks. Using his dark magic, Dracula punished Carmilla by binding her spirit inside a mask and dooming her to an existence trapped inside of it. He forced Hector to lead some of his army directly as a test of loyalty and Hector was in the front lines for the murder of innocents. He felt an extreme surge of sorrow and begged Dracula to stop the killings. Dracula agreed as long as Hector tracked down Trevor Belmont and murdered him. But Hector held no ill will, will towards Trevor and he had already been lied to by Dracula before. He began planning his escape from Dracula's grasp and agreed to lead a group of monsters to find and kill Trevor. Mankind's only hope was to let Trevor live and allow him to confront Dracula. And when Hector set out with his monsters, he turned on them and used his magic to destroy destroy them, but the monsters fought back and attacked him fiercely. Hector was wounded and collapsed from his injuries nearby. Soon after, a nun called Rosalie from a nearby village found Hector and wasn't sure if he was alive. She poked him with a stick and he opened his eyes, barely able to speak. Rosalie dragged him to her village with the help of a young boy called Ted, and Hector would survive his wounds thanks to their kindness. And thanks to Hector's betrayal, Dracula's monsters never found Trevor and his companions. They soon made it to the ruins of his old home, a place he had refused to return to since it was attacked. Ah, that's my tree. I used to play in that tree. We're nearly at the house. It's hard to imagine you playing. Yeah, I suppose so. It was everything, that tree. It was my house and my boat and my fort. Anything I wanted it to be. Good night, tree. The underground entrance of the Belmont estate was protected by a powerful magic barrier placed by one of the Belmont ancestors, and Trevor had no idea how to open it. He never learned to read, and he wasn't well versed in any magic. But Alucard and Sypha recognized the ancient language used to place the barrier, and she performed a spell to unlock it. Inside they found the astonishing sight of a massive library of knowledge gathered by generations of Belmonts before Trevor. even a Wallachian name. That just dawned on me. No. The family's originally from the Kingdom of France, but we moved out of there a few hundred years ago. We're professionals. We move where the work is. What does that even mean? All the dark things moved into the East. I think it was a Leon Belmont who entered the region first. <laughs> dug the foundations for everything under it.
my god. The memory of my family. All that's left of us. So this really is a managed collection? It's the work of generations. An archive of everything we've found and learned since the days of Leon Belmont. What was your Leon Belmont doing in Wallachia? Hunting Dracula. Inside the library, Trevor noticed a hidden chest, and he knew it contained his destiny, the vampire killer that Sonia had hidden before their home burned down. Bloody hell. Is that what I think it is? Careful, Trevor. You almost sounded excited about something. Ugly thing. I don't believe they hid it. It's the morning star. Some of Dracula's monsters had followed them to the Belmont estate and were threatening to barge in, and Trevor prepared to use the vampire killer whip the first time. Long ago, Leon's own children had discovered how to upgrade the whip's form into its chained appearance they called the Morning Star, making it even deadlier than it already was before. His confidence was returning to him, and the vampire killer responded and felt like a natural part of him. Underneath the estate, he also discovered the sword that his ancestor Leon Belmont wielded, and prepared himself to slay the enormous Minotaurus and the monsters it let in. When you get back to whatever steaming underworld shithole you came from, you tell them there are still Belmonts up here. Dracula could feel the destruction of the creatures he had sent to the Belmont estate. Trevor was still alive. Hector had failed him, but a thought wouldn't leave Dracula's mind. After giving him a home and teaching him the dark arts, had Hector betrayed their friendship? Isaac couldn't believe that Hector would betray Dracula, and he was commanded to find Hector and return him to the castle. If Hector had indeed betrayed him, he would be turned into a hideous monster and forced to eat sewage. Isaac was sent with another group of humans loyal to Dracula to find Hector while Hector was recovering in Rosalie's village. It was a strange feeling he hadn't felt before being shown kindness by a human. Growing up in his village, he was hated by his parents and the rest of the villagers, but Rosalie nursed him back to health, and the young boy that helped Rosalie save him, Ted, came to visit. Isaac had sent a werewolf to follow Hector's trail, and it followed directly to Rosalie's house. She yelled at Ted to run, but the boy was paralyzed by fear, and the wolf grabbed him. Hector heard their screams, grabbed his sword, and rushed to save them. With a single swipe, he decapitated the beast, rescuing Ted and Rosalie. Isaac sensed the werewolf's death and smiled with glee. Hector was still alive and he knew exactly where he was. And Dracula orders may have been to bring Hector alive, but Isaac believed that the traitor deserved death for abandoning Dracula. He turned against his own men and slaughtered them quickly to avoid any witnesses, and he rushed to the village and found Hector outside. 
Isaac attacked him without hesitation in a blind rage and caught Hector off guard, but Hector stepped aside quickly and slashed him. With an open wound heavily bleeding, Isaac stumbled and fell off the side of a cliff. Hector believed that Isaac was dead, and he was safe from Dracula's grasp for now. Rosalie was relieved to see Hector alive and well after his confrontation with Isaac and hugged him, and Hector hoped that Trevor would stop Dracula. Back in the Belmont estate, Sifo and Alucard had been researching how to keep Dracula's castle from moving. Together, they discovered a mirror that would allow them to view the castle's current location and Sypha used a powerful spell in an attempt to take control of the castle's engines. If she couldn't keep the castle from moving, she would try to bring the castle to them. It's fighting me! It's like I'm pulling against an anchor! And a water wheel all at once! Where did you land the castle, Cypher? Right on top of us. Dracula's castle was now right in front of the Belmont estate, and the trio began rising to the surface. Alucard would face his father for the first time in a year after suffering his injury, and Trevor caught a glimpse of his ancestor Leon and prepared himself to fulfill his legacy. Immediately after entering the castle, Dracula's vampire generals from all over the world caught a glimpse of the vampire killer and were frozen with fear. The Belmont had made it inside alongside Dracula's traitor's son and a speaker. I terrify them. Cypher disorients them. Alucard goes over the top and we support him. Yes. Begin.
Dracula's generals were destroyed and the organization of his army was starting to fall apart. Dracula waited at the top of the castle with death by his side as his final line of defense. Trevor and his companions traveled through the castle and climbed the tall clock tower, avoiding the advances of Medusa heads threatening to knock them down to their deaths. At the end of the clock tower, Trevor met the monster Dracula had in prison there, the mutated Grant Dynasty, the pirate rebel that attempted to stop Dracula himself. Trevor defeated Grant and broke the spell that Dracula had placed on him. His human form returned and he told them how to get to Dracula's throne room. Grant climbed down the tower toward the exit of the castle himself. While Trevor, Alucard, and Sypha faced Dracula, he would help the surrounding villages fight off the hordes. Getting to the throne room required them to make it through the ghost ship crashed on the side of the castle that Gallimoth had used long ago in an attempt to escape. The top of the ship led to the entrance of the castle's upper levels where several monsters resided, including Medusa, who was previously defeated by Sonya. But the monsters inside Dracula's castle never truly died as long as their master was still alive. It also held an ancient mummy from the faraway lands of Egypt, being possessed by the evil spirits within, and a monstrous creature created from the body parts of several different humans and brought to life by electricity. Trevor was nearing the top of the castle and crossed a bridge over the reservoir of water it contained. But the water didn't hold any normal fish. Dangerous mermen could pounce high out of the water, but the most dangerous creatures were the two fire-breathing dragons that resided underneath. As powerful as they were, the vampire killer could easily destroy them along with any demons from the underworld. Trevor fought his way through the onslaught of possessed suits of armor and skeletons of dead warriors as Sypha and Alucard supported him. One of the demons that enjoyed taunting humans in the castle was the Doppelganger, the same kind of entities that Leon faced in Walter's castle. The Doppelganger took the form of Trevor and copied his movements. The demon could attempt to imitate him, but it didn't have the years of training that he received as a youth. After destroying the doppelganger, they reached Death, Dracula's right-hand monster and final defender. The last time Death faced a Belmont, he was defeated and retreated. This time he was determined to make sure that the bloodline was finished. Death was sent plummeting back into the underworld he came from, and Dracula was left without any defenses. He knew his son had betrayed him and traveled with a Belmont, and as he waited, he remembered the message that Death had delivered to him so long ago. You have become a cursed being, and I will never forgive you. This whip and my kinsmen will destroy you someday. Your war is over. Because you say so. It ends in the name of my mother. It endures in the name of your mother. You couldn't stop me before. I was alone before. <laughs> be the Belmont. The end of your life.
Star Whip. Well played, Belmont. But I am no ordinary vampire to be killed by your human magics. I am Vlad Dracula Tepesh, and I have had enough! The combined assault and the direct impact from the vampire killer's morning star had given a crushing blow to Dracula. He had no choice but to shed his vampire form and gather the powers of chaos to gain his ultimate form. Trevor attacked him with the vampire killer mid-transformation and delayed his final form. As Dracula slowly transformed, his brain was enveloped by a grotesque arrangement of flesh and bones forming faces shifting with the appearance of his multiple victims. The blood dripping from this form became acidic to the touch and was incredibly painful for Dracula to maintain. But but his ultimate power soon emerged as he took the form of the Mesopotamian demon Pazuzu, a winged monster from the depths of hell that could fire multiple energy blasts. Dracula's final form was defeated and he reverted back into his vampire appearance. He was completely drained of his dark powers and Alucard took the opportunity to stake his father. Son. Father. Alucard, step back. Let me finish this. Dracula's power held the castle together, and his death caused the structure to begin crumbling. Just as Dracula was killed, Isaac was struggling to make it back to his home, still alive but heavily injured from his fight with Hector. He could feel Dracula's power disappearing, and witnessed one of the castle's creatures disintegrate right in front of him. The darkness in the land was dispelled, and Isaac swore that Hector would suffer immense pain for what he did, ending the events of Castlevania III, Dracula's Curse. The following morning, they returned to the castle ruins to ensure that Dracula was dead, and Alucard pondered what he would do next. He had gained an immense respect for the Belmont bloodline and felt that he had nothing else to offer the world. He planned to make the ruins of the castle his grave and put himself into hibernation for the ages to come. But Trevor offered him a better solution. He offered Alucard the Belmont estate, more importantly the treasure trove of secrets it contained underground. Behold, you sulky half-vampire bastard. I bequeath you the Belmont hold Make that and the castle your home, not your grave. Be its last defender. You're giving me your home. It's yours. My childhood home and your childhood home. Protect it. Make something out of it. Something better than a pile of ruins and a symbol of terror. 
Alucard accepted the offer and bid his companions farewell. All the hordes Dracula unleashed on the world didn't just vanish with him. Some areas were still in danger from various threats and vampires still existed. As a Belmont, Trevor still had much to do and Sypha decided to stay by his side as his partner. But for now, there was a moment of peace. The next couple of years brought major changes, and Alucard often found himself reminiscing about his life. He never had the opportunity to mourn his mother, and was haunted by the fact that he helped kill his own father. He remembered his father as a man of knowledge, and Alucard decided to learn as much as he could to make the world a better place, and spent much of his time exploring the books in the Belmont Stronghold. He became an expert on the Belmont bloodline, their history, their spells, weapons. Trevor and Sypha traveled the land fighting against monsters together, and were seen as heroes. Trevor had reclaimed respect for his family, and the name Belmont became legendary. While Dracula was defeated, Grant was on the ground fighting with the people of Valachia, and he was also deemed a hero. Alucard's role in his existence was kept secret and the trio of Trevor, Sypha, and Grant came to be known as the Legendary Three Warriors. Grant used his huge fortune from his pirate days to help reconstruct the cities, destroyed by Dracula's hordes. And even though the country rebuilt, the same darkness that almost destroyed it would soon cover the land again. Dracula was aware that a Belmont would possibly destroy him someday, and he prepared several backup plans to ensure his survival. Plans that would ensure humanity's extinction could continue without him. If he couldn't wipe out the human race, he would make sure they would destroy themselves. Immediately before Alucard staked his heart, Dracula conjured up enough dark energy within himself from the Chaos Realm that exploded outwards when he was killed, in a dark cloud of evil energy. Over the next three years, it spread through the land, slowly infecting the hearts and minds of the people, so slowly that it was almost impossible to notice. This was Dracula's curse, which drove innocent people to commit heinous acts and be constantly on edge. Famine had begun spreading, homelessness, more frequent witch burnings. Trevor felt that something wasn't right, and he remembered seeing that dark burst of energy when he faced Dracula. Monsters had begun appearing again, and Sypha acknowledged that a curse placed on the land was possible. Trevor set out to discover the source of what was causing the suffering, and Sypha stayed behind in their home. By this time they were married, and she was pregnant with their child. Dracula's curse had also infiltrated Isaac's mind, and he craved revenge against Hector. He watched him from a distance, biding his time until it was the right time to strike. Hector was happily living with Rosalie, and married her. She enjoyed spending much of her time growing apples and selling them in the local market place, but Dracula's curse had been planting the seeds of anxiety within the people, and Isaac knew exactly how to take advantage of the situation. He began spreading rumors around town that Rosalie was poisoning the apples with black magic and feeding them to the people, slowly making them sick. It was all lies, and just like Dracula's wife, Rosalie was taken by a mob and burned alive as a witch. By the time Hector heard what happened and raced to save her, all that was left were charred remains, and he screamed in agony. The curse had slowly begun to affect him, and he felt an intense rage. The townspeople described the man that reported her, and he immediately recognized Isaac. Hector swore that Isaac would pay for Rosalie's murder. Trevor made his way back to the ruins of Dracula's old castle to begin his investigation. Whatever was causing this resurgence of evil across the land was coming from there, leading to the year 1479 and the events of Castlevania. Curse of Darkness. Trevor went inside and found monsters that shouldn't have been there. By now, Alucard would have surely discovered the cause, but he had left the area and began traveling the world like his father. Dracula may have been dead, but his power was very much alive, resurrecting the creatures inside the castle. Trevor also noticed monsters appearing in the nearby mountain range, but a possessed armor stood in his way, shifting into impossible forms.
Hector was close behind, following Isaac's trail to the ruins of Castlevania. Show yourself, Isaac! I know you're here! Hector! Is that you? I finally tracked you down. Hector! The fool who betrayed our Lord Dracula. That matters not. I've come to exact my revenge upon you. For the death of Rosalie! Oh, and how will you have this revenge? <laughs> when you are utterly at my mercy. You relinquished your powers. You couldn't even protect your own woman. And now you think to defeat me. <laughs> I shed that evil power. Never again will I use it. Ah, but you will, Hector, and soon you have no choice. Without it, I could crush you in an instant. You deserve a most gruesome fate for the humiliation you brought upon me three years ago. You will reclaim your powers, and thence follow where I lead you. <laughs> but, in the end, the glorious vengeance you seek will not be yours. It will be mine. <laughs> Heed my words. I will hunt you down like the beast you are. I will have my revenge. Isaac taunted Hector to follow him inside the castle. Hector was in no condition to face Isaac with his current level of power. After he married Rosalie, he gave up devil forging to live a life of peace with her. In order to exact his revenge, he would have to revert to his old ways and use his powers to summon devils at his side, exactly as Isaac had planned. Dracula's curse had inspired Isaac to cause Rosalie's death and work towards resurrecting Dracula. His elaborate plan was designed to strengthen Hector enough to be used as a vessel to resurrect him. And when Hector arrived in one of his devil forging chambers, he met a mysterious stranger named Zed, who had been watching him for some time now. Well, well. Devil forging, isn't it? Never seen that before. Quite impressive. It's enough to make your blood run cold. Who are you? Oh, my apologies, my lord. I should have offered an introduction. I go by Zed. I'm here for one purpose only. To purify this land of the pestilent curse which infects it. I see. You, on the other hand, are pursuing the other Devil Forge Master, are you not? The one you seek fled toward the chapel on the other side of the mountain. He made his escape through the back of the castle. What concern is this to you? He is the one protecting the curse. Ergo, he is an impediment to me and to all those who abide in this land. I see. Very well. I, Hector, thank you for your help. Now, if you'll forgive me, I must be on my way. Zed was a priest claiming to seek the means to lift Dracula's curse. In reality, his intentions were much more nefarious. Although Trevor had defeated death three years ago, the curse created enough evil energy to resurrect him shortly after, and he took the form of Zed to ensure his master's resurrection when as planned. Zed continued guiding Hector to Isaac, watching the coming events unfold. And Hector had made it to the same room that Trevor had recently been in where he battled the crazy armor, and followed the path to the Valjet Mountains. Zed had seen Isaac running through the area, and Hector found it littered with monsters that he recognized from his time as one of Dracula's servants. And in these mountains, he would make a discovery that would shock him. He met Isaac's sister, Julia, who was the spitting image of Rosalie. Uh, it can't be. That's impossible. She can't be alive. Oh. May I be of service? Uh, no. Forgive me. My name is Hector. What are you doing in a place like this? I could ask you the same question, sir. I am searching for someone. A man bearing the same crest I'm wearing. And this man, is he your enemy or your friend? You sound as if you know him. Yes, quite so. Now answer me, be he your friend or foe? He is my most bitter enemy. I see. In that case, I shall help you. Pardon me, my lady, 
But by what reason would you offer me this boon? Indeed, by what reason should I trust it? Your enemy is my enemy. That is reason enough. If you are a Devil Forge Master, you shall need a place to keep your little friends safe. Rest assured, you have no reason to refuse my help. You seem quite knowledgeable. Who are you exactly? A witch. I escaped from the western lands where we were hunted like vermin. I have the power to envision the future. How interesting. And your name? Julia. My house is further on. I shall prepare an elixir that may be of use to you. Farewell, for now. Julia. She is the very image of Rosalie. Julia kept her relationship to Isaac to herself and decided to help Hector in his quest by providing her knowledge as a witch and selling him items in her nearby shop. She loved her brother, but could sense that his sanity was too far gone. He had to be stopped, even if it meant his death. The Garibaldi Temple, his next stop, was nearby, but a huge wyvern stood in his way, a being related to dragons that lived high in the mountaintops. After defeating the wyvern, Hector made it to the temple and met yet another person unfamiliar to him called Saint Germain, urging him not to pursue Isaac for his own mysterious reasons. I've been waiting for you, Hector. Devil Forge Master. How do you know me? Who are you? Saint Germain. I won't bandy words with you. I have an urgent request. Please, refrain from pursuing Isaac any further. Bastard! So you're with Isaac! But that does not follow. Isaac wishes to fight me. For what purpose do you make this request? This will not make sense to you, but to put it simply, I seek to maintain the flow of a greater will. This is pointless. Out of my way! Your beloved was killed on false allegations that she was a witch. I know how you feel, and I sympathize truly, but please look past Rats, your own... Rats! How do you know of these things? That... I cannot tell. I know far more than you imagine. But I cannot act upon that knowledge. That is my... <laughs> arrangement. I may only observe. I, I have no choice but to excuse myself. Please, consider my request. The world hangs in the balance. Goodbye. Who was that? The conflict with Dracula was destined to continue well into the future, and Saint Germain belonged to an organization of time travelers called the Time Watchers. The Time Watchers were responsible for protecting the timeline and ensuring that future events proceeded without any anomalies or interruptions. Saint Germain was sent to this time by his superior, a man named Aeon. Although he was supposed to be merely an observer from the shadows, he found Hector's strength fascinating and wanted to meet him. And Garibaldi Temple was a powerful nexus of dark energy. Dracula's followers had used it in the past to perform human sacrifices, and it was all gathering deep inside the temple, preparing to give birth to a being that could threaten the entire world. Hector came upon its chambers and found a horrific sight. The creature's cocoon was formed of countless human bodies, forming a monster known as Legion, and its core was feeding from the suffering caused by Dracula's curse. Hector attacked the outer shell in an attempt to reveal the core, and the creature brewing inside was awakened, but still in an incomplete form.
Hector suspected that the monster in the temple's history of sacrifices may have had a role in causing the disturbance and spreading across the land. But even with Legion's destruction, the curse was still strong. Trevor had also been drawn to the temple, and Hector finally met the man that killed Dracula. That whip! Could he be? Answer me! Are you the Devil Forge Master? I am. Then this is the hour of your death. <laughs> On your oath, are you truly the Devil Forge Master? And if I am? For one that served under Dracula, you seem much too weak. It's been said that the Devil Forge Master's power rivals that of death. Ah, so you are hunting for Isaac as well, I see. As well? Then you're not... Wait... I recall there was another Devil Forge Master. They say he betrayed Dracula and forswore his powers, but that was three years ago during the war. Could he have survived? It cannot be. Believe what you like, but answer me this. Are you not Trevor Belmont, the one who defeated Lord Dracula? That I am, though I did not fight alone. There were many brave warriors beside me. And your name, sir? Hector. Hector. I shall remember that name. Hector was completely shocked by the raw power that Trevor displayed. It was no wonder that Dracula was slain. Trevor did have help from Alucard and Sypha during the final battle against Dracula, but he had improved greatly in the last three years. He fully embraced his role as a Belmont, learned some magical abilities from Sypha, and he was knowledgeable on some of the dark arts Dracula had practiced to form seals and barriers in the castle. But Trevor saw that Hector held no malice towards him and knew he wasn't the enemy. But Hector's main concern was Isaac. He was strictly focused on his vengeance and nothing would stop him. Zed continued guiding him through the aqueducts, and Saint Germain appeared to him again, looking for Zed. Saint Germain had secrets of his own, and it was clear that the two men were connected in ways that Hector couldn't figure out just yet. The aqueduct was a haven for aquatic creatures like mermen, and the deadly Skeletal Diver, a master of water, riding a huge fish. The skeletal Diver had killed countless humans during Dracula's War on Humanity, and prevented many from escaping Eastern Europe through the sea. Hector was already reaching his previous strength, and commanded his innocent devil expertly to assist him in battle. The town of Cordova was close by, and Hector believed that the locals could have information on Isaac's location. But first he had to cross the haunted forest of Jigramund, filled with deadly threats that would end a normal human, and caught a glimpse of Zed and Saint Germain arguing. Saint Germain left and Zed was clearly frustrated with his appearance. Saint Germain had formed a rivalry with Death. He represented time, and Death found him to be a nuisance. Monitoring the timeline meant that the Time Watchers could interfere with any plans not in accordance with recorded history, and Death would use any means necessary to ensure Dracula's return. Another resurrected creature from Dracula's war was the Minotaurus that Trevor had killed underneath the Belmont estate. The beast was returned to life, furious and bloodthirsty, with an open wound on its back. After the Minotaurus was destroyed, Hector arrived in Cordova town, but the residents would be unable to help him. The town had been massacred by the monsters in the area and Isaac. The villagers were returning from the dead as mindless zombies, and Isaac waited for Hector to arrive. So, you've caught up already. Isaac! 
<sighs> it's still too soon, but all the same. I'll test your abilities and see how much of your power has been restored. Ah, how gratifying. Your power is indeed returning, but it's still not enough. Brother, stop. Julia. Return, Abel! Brother? What an annoying interruption. Well, so be it. It's still too early to finish you anyway. Regain more of your power first. You'll need it all if you hope to kill me. You are not getting away! No! Let him go! You were in league with Isaac all along! Think what you like! But I do wish for you to stop him honestly. Then why did you keep me from him? Because it is too soon. You still lack the strength and spirit to defeat him. My brother is in the venomous grip of Lord Dracula's curse. The desires of a single man mean nothing. The curse rules him. Then go with Belmont or one of his vampire slayers. Someone you can be sure of. No, Hector. You must be the one to defeat him. My brother has always respected you. Only you can free him from the curse. Isaac ran away at the sight of his sister, and Julia revealed the truth to Hector. She begged Hector to free Isaac from the grip of Dracula's curse. Hector fought his way through a machine tower while following him. And inside the machine tower, Zed had placed a magical barrier and trapped St. Germain inside of it. But Hector was able to get in, and St. Germain realized that he can interact with the world physically in there. For his own entertainment, he challenged Hector to a duel. So, Zed hasn't slain you yet? I see you were spying on us. How did you get here? On foot. Most interesting. Yes, that is quite possible. What are you saying? Well, in this space, I may be partially freed of the fess of time. Well, that means I can have a direct physical effect here. For example, I could fight you. So is that your intent? Stop! I promise not to interfere with you again. Very well. I now see how fascinating time, or rather, fate, truly is. Just who are you? A traveler. Only half here. Not allowed to speak the truth. Not allowed to act upon reality. Yet. One who knows all. That about covers it. I see. Not allowed to speak the truth. Uh, please forget everything I have told you. A traveler merely passes through, touching nothing, changing nothing. St. Germain had interfered in the events of the year 1479 too much already, and felt that everything was moving as it was supposed to. He said goodbye to Hector and left, doing his duty from a distance and monitoring the flow of time. Trevor had made it far ahead into nearby ruins and encountered Isaac himself after he ran away from his battle with Hector. Isaac was still weak from his previous fight, and Trevor had the upper hand. Even the power of Isaac's innocent devil couldn't stop the Belmont. <laughs> Lord Dracula by a fluke, a mere twist of fortune, yet I grant you are adept. Hector! I need not linger here any longer. I've gotten what I need. But mark me well, I will slay both of you without fail. Without fail. He fled when he saw you. There can be no doubt of it, then. You are indeed his enemy. 
Just as I told you when we first met. Be that as it may, I am the one who shall vanquish him. Your meddling is unwelcome. Leave him to me. Pity. How unfortunate. Such a rare opportunity. Squander. On the contrary, to obtain the vengeance I seek, Isaac must be slain by my hand alone. Ergo, nothing was lost. Think you so? Then you shall be glad to know where he is bound. And where might that be? The castle ruins where we first met. Do you remember the place? Isaac was hiding in a deep chamber hidden below Dracula's castle. Hector met with Trevor to tell him, but they wouldn't be able to travel into the chamber together. It was sealed away by powerful magic that could only be undone by spilling the blood of the Belmont clan. Trevor could open the passageway, but he wouldn't be able to travel inside of it. Hector was truly the only man that can go forward now, but Trevor needed to make sure that he was ready. It cannot be avoided. You must show me just how much power you've gained. Wait! I have no reason to fight you! This is your reason. Defend yourself! It's as if you're an entirely different person. Why did you attack me? The place to which Isaac has gone can only be entered by those who possess very advanced powers I had to test you. Belmont blood acts as a key. And what lies beyond this point? Do not ask. If you knew, your heart might waver. For now, hold the image of Isaac in your mind. Think only of defeating him. Very well. Hector, hunt him down. And when you have him, show him no mercy. The passageway led to an area outside of space and time called the Infinite Corridor, an alternate dimension where Hector believed Isaac was waiting, but it was all a charade created by death. To resurrect Dracula, his castle needed to be returned, and this would require an influx of dark energy. The Infinite Corridor was the prison of the entity known as the Dulahan, a headless monster eternally condemned to search for his missing head. produced in battle is more than uh, enough. Uh, mm -hmm. Isaac's plan had been revealed. Defeating the Dulahan released all the internal dark energy it held, and it was channeled into resurrecting Dracula's castle. Castlevania had taken a new form and appeared in a different location. Trevor survived the injury from Isaac, but barely.
Before you stands Dracula's castle. Aye. The curse that was unleashed three years ago still emanates from it. Does this mean the source of the curse is still present? At this rate... Tis likely the remnants of Dracula's magic. And all because of me. Damn. I know not what happened to you in the past, but there's no time for regret. We must try to cleanse the castle and dispel the vile curse. If the curse spurs from demonic power, I may be able to find the source. Indeed, I must. For this is something only I can do. Then make haste. If the castle is fully resurrected, it is possible that Dracula is revived. If that is so, we must call Belmont. It is he who slew Dracula before. He can help us now. Alas, he cannot. But why? He suffered a terrible injury. I, I barely saved his life. But even now, it hangs by a thread. Twas my brother's work and no other. I see. A Devil Forge Master is easily susceptible to Dracula's magic. Do not let the curse take hold of you. I'm certain that she would not wish you to pay such a price for your revenge. So, you know about Rosalie? The hour is late. Away to your purpose. And you to safety. Back to your home. Hector. Please, do not die. Hector would have to face whatever presence was inside the castle by himself. Since the castle changed form, the inside was naturally unfamiliar to him, and some of Dracula's strongest servants made their home inside, resurrected alongside it. Hector dreaded the thought that Dracula could be alive again. He could feel Isaac's presence and was well prepared for the battle. Hector was able to summon a similar demon called the End that Isaac had also used, and the immensely powerful weapon the Laser Blade, a one-handed weapon that many believed didn't exist, but a Devil Forge Master had deep knowledge on weapon crafting. This would be the final battle between former allies. You resurrected the castle! Hector, bravo! You wanted me to regain my powers. Now I see why. I fell right into your plot. I've been waiting quite a long time to plot my revenge. Not only did my lord die because of you, you stripped me of my pride, my home. Now I shall make you suffer as I suffered. You shall die a most painful, gruesome death! Not let the curse take hold of you. This murderous impulse. This thirst for bloody vengeance. This is not me. It is the curse. Dracula's curse. Oh, oh, and you would not fall prey to the curse. Praiseworthy indeed. I wonder why. Was your desire for vengeance weak, or was your spirit strong? No matter. Either way, it is well finished. Your efforts have been a great boon to me. The moment you wavered was all I needed. Said. So, you're the one behind all of this. For Lord Dracula to be reborn in you, the curse had to take hold of you. When you rejected the curse, you proved to be useless. That weapon! You are none other than death! Soon my master will enter Isaac's body. Though you were favored, Isaac will do. Dracula will once more walk the night. And as for you, it is time for you to die.
Death had no more secrets to hide. He shed a Zed persona and unleashed his fury on Hector. He hoped that Hector would allow the darkness inside to take over, but he constantly resisted, making him an impossible vessel for Dracula's return. He believed Isaac to be an inferior substitute, but there was no other choice left. The resurrection would take some time, and Death needed to keep Hector distracted until the ritual could be completed. <laughs> A mere human has beaten me! Hector rushed to Dracula's throne, hoping his old master hadn't returned, but it was too late. Dracula had resurrected, and Isaac's body took his form. And for the first time since Hector left the castle, Dracula faced the traitor he deemed responsible for his defeat. Ah. <sighs> The traitor Hector. Lord Dracula, you are reborn! Why did you betray me? Why did you unleash your hatred upon the humans? When you began slaughtering them indiscriminately, I had no choice but to disobey you! You sighed against me for the sake of humans! Humans are not worth the air they breathe! I sentenced them extinction. Sympathy is merely a form of weakness. You betrayed me, Hector, and for that, the punishment is death. I stand ready. I will not flee as I did before. ditch effort to destroy Hector, Dracula summoned a monstrous demonic form to face him. He needed more time to gain his full power, and Isaac's body wasn't strong enough to contain Dracula's power. Dracula was mighty, but Hector had the advantage. Now that Dracula was in a weakened state, he could slay him and send him back to the underworld. The only way to save Wallachia and end Dracula's madness was to kill Dracula and lift his curse. Transformation. Was it not complete? So it would seem. Oh, the curse. My soul may return to the abyss, but the curse will not be lifted. It will fester in the hearts of humans until they obliterate themselves. Have you forgotten? I am a Devil Forge Master. I can turn your curse aside, transform it into something harmless, and so it shall be. of darkness! Release to me one of the tortured souls. Let me infuse him with my life force and awaken him to the world of the living! Immaculate being, appear before me now!
has ended. I feel I can let go now, and die in peace. You look ghastly. Julia! Why did you come here? I thought you might be contemplating something foolish, like letting go. You see through it all, don't you? You've paid your debt, have you not? From this day on, you must live true to your own heart. Farewell, Isaac. Dracula was destroyed and his full resurrection was prevented. The curse lifted from Wallachia and the evil festering in the hearts of the people vanished. Peace had finally returned. Hector and his innocent devils decided to live with Julia, and Trevor returned home to Sypha after healing, ending the events of Castlevania, Curse of Darkness. Join me next time for the perfect Castlevania Timeline Part 3, The Order of Shadows, where a new world healed by time is free from the terror of Dracula, but a cult appears from the shadows that worships Dracula as their god, and Trevor's descendants must ensure that the same destruction Dracula caused would never be seen again. Since you made it to the end of this video, I assume you enjoyed it, so why don't you go ahead and smash that like button, subscribe, and ring the bell so you don't miss any new content. You can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, links in the description below, and if you'd like to support the channel, you can join my Patreon or become a channel member. This is Fabian, I love you guys, and I'll see you next time.